this is Ralph from Happy Dog Training. Today I want to talk about something that comes up quite a bit when I talk to clients during consultations on the phone, and that is statements about my dog is dominant or my dog is submissive. But that happens a lot. <clears throat> so people will say that to me in all kinds of contexts, uh, and usually it's not the case at all. So what that tells me is that that idea of dogs being permanently dominant or submissive has really been put in people's heads, probably by TV trainers. I, I can only speculate on that. But there's tons of stuff on TV, there's tons of stuff on social media that is just off by so much when it comes to reality. It's just trying to make entertainment. And I realize this video is going to be on social media too, but it's, it's filmed for the website and it's, not, not so much film for social media per se, but you will find it on YouTube, um, which is where you might be watching this. Anyway, so dominance and submission are not permanent states of mind. And these words are thrown around quite a bit by a lot of trainers even, who seem to also not fully grasp what, what these terms mean and where they're coming from and what, what the origin is and so forth, that the confusion makes sense. It, it, there's a lot of misinformation. So... I, w I want to give a little bit of an overview of what what that actually is, what these terms mean, and how they apply. And with that, hopefully, it makes more sense of what's real for your dog and what's fantasy that, that people have just created for themselves to fit something or squeeze something in their view on, on canines that may or may not be accurate. So dominance and submission are activities or the behaviors the behaviors that dogs display when they negotiate over resources. So you can view as dominance and submission the escalation and de-escalation techniques. And it's, it's basically two bullies on the schoolyard settling who gets the soccer ball or football or whatever, and they escalate, and at some point someone caves in. Yeah? So I want that ball. Now I'm not going to give it to you. Oh, you're going to give me that ball. I don't think so. You're going to give me that ball. Okay, okay, I'll give you the ball. So it's, it's escalation, escalation, met with escalation, 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 de-escalation. Huh? And that's what this is. So dominance and submission are strategies, the behaviors that dogs use to negotiate over resources. A as a, a dog trainer friend of mine likes to say, dogs negotiate through threats of violence and escalation of force. And that is exactly what that is. So, and I'm going to put um, a screenshot in this video where you can see what those are, but there is generally this nine dominance signals, and dominance behaviors that dogs use in negotiation, and there are six submission behaviors that they use for de-escalation. And it is always in the context of negotiating over resources. And anything can be a resource. It, it doesn't have to be food. It could be it could be water, it can be toy, it can be a person, it can be a location, it can be, it can be anything. Ob obviously, mates, if, I mean, our dogs, they don't go around, get to mate randomly. Their, their pets, they live in the home, they have restrictions. But in the wild, the mate is the most valuable resource a predator generally will fight over or engage in battle. But all of these are negotiation tactics. So you have these 50 negotiation tactics, nine dominant, six submission, that dogs will use to negotiate over resources. And using dominance displays and dominance signals doesn't have the function of starting a fight. It has the opposite function, is about avoiding a fight. So using dominance and submission signals and trying to win the resource in this negotiation game is about avoiding a fight, not starting one. So when you hear a term like dominance aggression, that per se is a misnomer. I mean, it's, it's we, we use it, I, I'm guilty of that myself. I've used it, I use it sometimes. It, it, it explains it in a way that people have come to understand, but it's not an accurate term. It's not a correct phrase, it doesn't exist. So when you have dominance and then you go to actual aggression, like a real fight, when, when you have an actual behavior that goes into, we're going to battle now you have true aggression at work. Well, not true aggression, but you have aggression at work. When dominance and submission signals have ended, when the negotiation has failed, 
for moving on into the fight stage, if it's worth doing that. Uh, and basically, dominance has ended. Dominance failed. Submission failed and dominance failed. When we're going to fighting, there is no more dominance. Now it's battle. Now it's war. Uh, so now, now we're going to go to the, the length it, we're willing to go to obtain the resource. That's what this is, how, how this relates to actual fighting. So when you see dogs engage in these dominance and submission displays, and these would be things like growling, baring teeth, um, putting teeth on without um, like ripping and tearing holes into it just yet, but posturing, that would be like dominance signals, some of them. Um, submission signals would be like um, lowering the head, coming up in a submissive like lower head position, or rolling over, or showing vulnerability, this is a submission signal. But there is a variety of submission signals that they can be used to de-escalate a situation. So, but de these are signals when, when dogs engage with that, they will get together and their paws go up and they'll, they'll growl and snarl and it, it looks wild. I mean, it's, it scares the crap out of most people. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Uh, let, let's not ignore that. And it certainly is a dangerous portion of the whole negotiation. It's not that that is not dangerous. It's not that there couldn't be injuries. But at this point, the goal is not to actually hurt anybody or cause an injury. The goal at this stage is to win the resource, win the negotiation. So, uh, and these are the things that most people will actually already call fighting. But that's not fighting. Fighting doesn't have noises. Fighting is a pretty silent activity per se. Um, there is no growling, posturing, like producing yourself, making yourself look stronger, bigger, and trying to... Uh, it's not, no, we're serious now. We're going to switch over to fighting, and now we're not going to waste our resources on a lot of vocalization. Now we're going to go at it, because that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to now obtain the resource through battle, because the first part didn't work out, and the resource is worth to go into battle for. I'll get back to that in a moment, because most resources are not. But that's, that, that's how this goes. Uh, so when, generally when dogs get together in these altercations, that's when people interrupt them already. They don't let it go further. So you often don't even know how it would end. And you can't also just let it play out because there could be injuries, there could be death. I mean, this is not, this is not something you can just ignore and just sit by and like, oh, let me just enjoy the show and see how that ends. That's a really dumb idea. So that's some, some people have told me this, oh, let's just let them work it out. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> so, um, it depends on the dogs if they can work it out. So some dogs, if they have good negotiation skills and you know them both well and you know they can sort something out without going to war and they're not going to push it that far, yeah, you could. But that requires you knowing those dogs very well and also requires you to, to understand dogs and dog behavior quite well. So for most people, that's not uh, a strategy I would recommend. Uh, Although I've certainly had people tell me that's what they wanted to do, and it's like, well, okay, if that's what you want to do, we, you can either we can either do it under with proper setup, and I can supervise it, or you can do it on your own, and then I want nothing to do with that because well, it's all anyway. So I guess a little bit off track, but negotiation looks wild and uh, doesn't lead to injury so much. When dogs get together and they actually go at it, and they're together for more than three seconds. Three seconds this seems to be kind of the magic number here. But if they're more than three seconds together and nobody has a hole in them yet, they're not fighting. They're still negotiating. Now, because when it goes to war, it's like, it's on. Not, we're going to now puncture. We're not going to use our teeth to cause damage. Because that's what predators do. So it's not that there is any kind of doubt if you have a dog fight. If dogs go together for a minute and they just go and go and go, and people say, oh, they were fighting for a minute, and then I asked them, well, were they injured? Oh, luckily not. Well, they weren't fighting. They were negotiating at this point. Huh? And I understand why somebody would say they're fighting because it looks, looks pretty gnarly. But there's usually no injuries during the stage because that's not the goal. The goal is to avoid all of that. So I hope that makes sense. So dominance and submission signals are used for negotiation. So where do these, like, nine, the total of 15, nine and six, where does that come from, huh? So there, uh, the first time I read about it was in a book by um, uh, Temple Grannon, it's called Animals Make Us Human, who referenced a study from the Bora Goodwin, which I, I'll put links in the, uh, under the video. And this study outlined how the negotiation goes. I'm going to put a screenshot up in the video here at this stage with the, the signals 
I have a full list of them. Leave it up a little bit while I keep talking. And these signals are used for this battle, for this negotiation. Now, when dogs grow up, they grow up the same way wolves do. So I'm going to switch to wolves for a moment because they are still related, their ancestors, obviously. So as a wolf puppy matures through the process of the puppy stage, what they do is they develop these nine dominant signals first, um, and then they develop the six submission signals afterwards. So in the progression of development, dominance is developed before submission is developed. You develop the, uh, the uh, escalation skills before they develop the de-escalation skills. That is important when we now go back to dogs because dogs are developmentally wolf puppies. So as, as dogs go through the mental development cycle, they don't go all the way through. So a wolf who will have all the 50 negotiation skills in negotiation with his, uh, with his fellow wolf members of his species, um, dogs go through that to some extent, but they don't go through all of them. But they go through them in the same order. So again, dominance skills are developed first, and then de-escalation skills, submission skills are developed second. The only dog breed that goes through the entire cycle and has the whole spectrum of negotiation skills is the Siberian Husky. So Huskies are very good at negotiation, ne negotiating conflict because they genetically have the whole spectrum of skills. They have a broad skill set. Um, on the extreme side of this, where a dog would just go through the cycle up to the dominant skills to some degree, or all of them, but has no submission skills whatsoever, so it can't de-escalate at all, would be like a King Charles Spaniel, for example. That would be a dog breed that has all the escalation skills, but has no de-escalation skills. <laughs> so that they, they can get themselves into a lot of trouble very well, but if the other dog doesn't back down, they have no way out of that situation. They have to now engage, and given that they're small animals, when they're up against a bigger dog, that's probably going to be the end of them. Uh, because when it comes to the actual battle, size matters. In the negotiation, when the dominance and submission skills are used for negotiating the resources, size doesn't matter yet. But when it comes to the actual battle, size will matter a lot because the stronger one tends to win, uh, unless the other one has mad, mad killing skills, which is... Probably not going to be the case with a small small dog. Um, so, but that's that's that development. That's that cycle. So, um, I think the German Shepherd, which is my favorite breed, obviously, um, they go through. They have all the dominant skills. They go through. I think they have four, if I recall this right, four or five of the de-escalation skills. So, a German Shepherd is also very good at it. There is one breed of a Labrador Retrievers. It's a very specific bloodline. It's not all Labrador Retrievers, so most likely you don't have one of those in your house. It's a very specific hunting line um, that is referenced in that study by Deborah Goodwin. Again, the link will be in the video, under the video. Um, that also has no de-escalation skills, but it's a Labrador. So, meaning that Labrador may just have the escalation and no de-escalation skills, but like Labradors often tend to be, they're goofy dogs. So they don't necessarily get themselves into situations where that matters. So when you, when you have a really big doofus of an animal, love labs are, it's just adorable doofuses, right? <laughs> we all know labs. <laughs> they're just adorable. But they're goofy. And so they'll, they'll do all kinds of nutty stuff, but they don't tend to, I mean, never say never. Obviously, this happens. I mean, I get aggressive Labradors too, but... Like a lot of Labradors, they just get, don't get themselves in these situations where these negotiations matter a whole lot. They're more aloof um, with things. So it, it doesn't matter all that much to them. And there's only one specific bloodline, as I said, where this actually is the case. I think um, that the standard Labrador that you have in your house, I actually don't know. Um, there, there's definitely de-escalation skills that Labradors have that I've seen. I don't know how many. Uh, but this was one specific thing they mentioned in that study. It was kind of interesting to me. But that's where this is coming from. So the developmental cycle ends at some point, and depending on how many of the skills were developed, a dog will either have only dominant skills or some submissive skills, or in the case of Siberian Husky, all of them. Um, it's the only dog breed that has all of them. There's no other dog breed that does. There's others that have five or four, but six, like all submissive skills, only the Husky does. But these are negotiation skills, and that's how they develop, and that's how they exist in dogs, and that's what the purpose is, is to avoid a battle to avoid a fight, not start one. You know? So, now the, the other thing, I, so I hope that makes sense. And so, 
when your dog when you say the uh, your dog is dominant well that is not a meaningful statement your dog is not a dominant all the time your dog may use dominant signals and dominance displays in negotiations or at times even with you it's it's not that a dog couldn't do it with a person like standing over a bone and growling that's a dominant signal now the question is how does this continue uh, if you are a human being it is probably not the smartest move to push that and escalate that in the way people do so there, there is that, that's not a good idea you don't have the teeth to defend yourself and you cannot really escalate that as well as a dog could and then de-escalate in the same fashion so these, these things is it's not that they couldn't have an impact on your life or living with your dog absolutely can it's just important to understand it's also important to not take anything i'm saying as um brushing it aside i'm not i'm not trying to minimize the danger of it i'm not trying to minimize the injury risk that can occur during the negotiation of dominant signals. I, I don't want to minimize that at all. Please do not take that lightly. Please take these things seriously. So if your dog is taking, um, sending you dominant signals when you're trying to collect a food bowl or take a toy away from him, this can be a real problem. Right? So your dog could have possessive aggression behaviors that would not be healthy for you to just ignore or brush aside. This can lead to serious injury. A lot of people have gotten bitten by their dogs in situations like that. So don't misinterpret that. I'm not trying to minimize anything. I'm trying to explain what it is and what it isn't. So a dog isn't permanently dominant. He may use dominant signals and dominant displays to accomplish an outcome. Which now, the next, the next thing that I want to switch to real quick, briefly, is aggression. Because now if the negotiation has failed aggression begins and, and there's aggressive behaviors in negotiation but aggression now is full out we're going to battle and we're going to put our teeth on things and we're going to put hold on things and tear on it and cause injury um but again in this context causing injury isn't necessarily the goal the goal is to win the war over the resource so understanding what the goal of the dog is always matters why is this relevant to this animal? What does this animal try to accomplish here? Is what we have to think of and look at when we, when we see any kind of aggressive behavior in any context. Uh -huh. um, so aggression or aggressive behavior, is, I, I really like to not say aggression because it seems such a general thing, my dog's aggressive. Well, your dog is being aggressive in certain situations. Your dog is showing aggressive behavior in certain situations. Aggression per se is not unusual. Aggression per se is completely normal. Aggression is something that exists in any society that has a social structure. So humans obviously have a social structure, dogs have a social structure, baboons have a social structure. Any group of animals that lives in a, a group has a social structure and aggression is an important part of regulating the experience that these members of, of the species have with one another. It's part of dealing with things. So it is not abnormal for a dog to show aggressive behaviors. Our problem that we have as dog owners when we live with dogs is when the aggression is displayed in inappropriate circumstances. So if I have um, a dog that lives in my house and somebody comes in that I invite into my home that is a visitor, somebody I'm happy to see, someone I want to have in my house, and my dog goes and bites that person, that's a problem. We can't have that, right? A, it's unacceptable. B, we might get sued. C, someone get injured. <laughs> or B and C, change them up if you like. But in, it's not something we can have. It has to stop. We have to end it. It's not if we can't... Um, we can't just ignore that. So we, we can't have our dogs biting people. That's not good. So the display of aggression in this context is completely unacceptable. Now, if somebody breaks through the window at night, a burglar or whatever, whatever their intentions may be, and my dog bites that person, that's not a problem at all. I, that, that's a perfectly fine behavior to, to have for my dog. I appreciate that. Um, it's good teamwork because now I can come in and we can do it together because <laughs> clearly we're going to have to deal with this one. So now in this, in this context, 
That's a fine behavior. That aggression that's displayed here is perfectly okay, while when it's displayed in another scenario, it's not. If my dog bites kids on skateboards who are coming by, that's a problem. If he bites the burglar or the person who attacks me, that's not a problem. So it depends on the context. But don't think that aggression is unusual, abnormal, or something's wrong with your dog when your dog shows aggressive behavior. He's not. He may show it in um, inappropriate context, and we have to absolutely address that and change that. But it's not that aggressive behavior is generally an issue. You would never find a dog that can, under no circumstances, show an aggressive behavior. That's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. Right? Um, same with people. Right? The most peaceful person will have an aggressive behavior at some point when they have to defend them, their life, you know, act. So it's, it's not that the behavior itself is the issue. It's the context is displayed in. That's where the issue comes in. And if the dog shows it in an inappropriate context, well, that needs to be addressed. So, but that's, that's how you also should think of aggression. Right? It, it's not a problem per se for your dog to show aggressive behavior. If it's in the right context, it's totally fine. So when you take, um, for example, a bite sport, protection sports, where dogs get to bite under controlled circumstances, people in bite suits, bite sleeves, bite toys, or you play even tug of war with your dog. That, that's in your home. Um, by, and by all means, you should play tug of war with your dog, but you should learn how to do it correctly. So if you can't learn how to play it correctly, then maybe you shouldn't. But if you, if you are able to learn how to do it correctly, you absolutely should if your dog's into it, because that's a wonderful outlet for their drives and desires. Um, if, if that is something your dog enjoys, not every dog does, but dogs who enjoy some conflict, they enjoy, enjoy fighting per se, uh, overcoming obstacles and struggles, that's a wonderful outlet for them to have. So if a dog bites a bite toy during a game, but he doesn't bite my hands and he doesn't redirect on me and he doesn't do anything other than biting the toy and that, we are, um, that we're interacting with, that's a perfectly fine way of showing aggression because that is some aggression. It's control, but it's aggression. Um, if the dog is sent into biting a decoy in a sport, but it's under control of the handler, he waits until I tell him to, he lets go once I tell him to. Uh, protection sport. Or the same thing, hopefully, with police dog or military dogs, as though their training is not as advanced as, as high-level protection sport is. Sport training is, is way better than what we deploy in the field with police and military, which is kind of, it should bother all of us, but it's, <laughs> it's a different conversation. But in, 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 the, like in the bite sport world, this is where you find the highest level of training because they're controlling aggression. Uh, there's a book called uh, Controlled Aggression even by uh, Jerry Bradshaw, who is the uh, creator of an American bite sport called PSA. I, was in, I believe that stands for Protection Sport Association. So it's, it's a, one of the bite sports. There's multi multitude of bite sports. That's one of them. And... That's what this is about. It is a controlled form of aggression, completely fine. Dogs that are trained properly in a sport like that, they don't go around biting people. Huh? They, they have, A, they enjoy this, they have an outlet, it's channeled, they understand the parameters under which it's okay and under which it's not. And they, they are not the dogs that go bite the strangers that come to the house. They wait until the handler tells them to, and then they'll bite. <laughs> but that's controlled aggression. Yeah? So I'm not sure if the laws have changed or what the rules are these days on this, but I believe if you have a level three, not sure if that's still like the right term, level three train protection dog that is legally in the United States, I think treated like a, like a gun. Basically that dog will be under control of you. You can give orders and if that dog bites someone on your command, that is the same as you firing a gun at that person. So the assumption there is it's an appropriate context. It's a legal context in which you would fire a gun on an intruder or something like that. And if you send the dog instead, that's fine then, if you have that level of control on the dog. That's, so the law does not distinguish in this context. The law does distinguish if the dog is not trained, even though that would be the same behavior per se, but that's, well, again, a long conversation, completely off track, but little side note. So, so aggression is only a problem if it's displayed in inappropriate contexts. And that needs to be addressed. If my dog rips a squirrel apart, he caught in the backyard, don't care. Enjoy. Have a free meal. 
congratulations. They're hard to catch. Um, good boy. <laughs> good girl. But if, if the, the aggression is displayed towards a human in an inappropriate context, someone who didn't attack me, someone who doesn't deserve to get bitten, that's a problem um, in, on many levels. So we would have need to address that, but we should never think that the behavior per se is a problem behavior. It's a problem context. It's a, that may not, some people may think there is no difference. What's the, what's the difference? What's the point? It's a huge difference. It's a big point, and it's an important point. And I hope you understand the difference. Uh, so the, it's a huge difference of all aggression is bad versus aggression is bad in the wrong context. Uh, if you're a boxer and you're going a ring and you box, that's, that's a perfect place to display aggressive behavior. If you walk in the supermarket and punch people who are standing in line, that's a very problematic place to display this kind of behavior. So it, it is where you display the behavior, if it's appropriate or not. And that's the same with a dog. So don't think it's unnatural for a dog to have aggressive behaviors. Um, I'm going to talk about this in, in another video, but just a quick side note, it's the same with fear. Uh, fear is a perfectly valuable behavior to have in the right circumstance. If Michael Myers with a butcher's knife comes after you, you should be afraid. It's probably, it's probably a good call to be afraid of that and get out of there. Um, but if you're afraid uh, for reasons that make no sense, if you're afraid of benign things in your environment, well, that's, that's a huge issue. And that, that obviously impacts your quality of life. So any emotion, any behavior per se can have an appropriate context and an inappropriate context. And if it's displayed in the right context, it's fine. If it's displayed in an inappropriate context, it's not. Uh, but don't think of behavior as problematic in general. Think of behavior as context specific well is this acceptable here or not uh so that that is what i wanted to um to talk about so dominance and submission explained and also aggression and how to think about it a quick primer um these are topics as i said they come up when clients can call me for consultations they come up in training they come up in conversations with dog trainers and these these are ethological terms especially dominance and submission these terms were coined by ethologists, and they have specific meanings, and they should be used appropriately. They should not be used the way um, TV trainers throw them around or YouTube trainers throw them around who don't fully understand dogs. These terms have meanings, and not everybody gets to make up their own, their own definitions of what things are. So we, we can't function that way if we just call things what we want to call them without any regard for what they actually are defined as. Because we have agreed as people in a society of what certain things are named. We've agreed on names and terms and terminology of how we call certain things. If everybody calls that thing a chair and I go and call it a bench, then I'm the odd one out, not the other people who have stick to the definition that the rest of society has agreed on. It's a chair. It's for one person. So definitions mean something. Words matter. So when we talk about dogs, we should talk about them correctly. We shouldn't talk about them casually and throw phrases around that are not fully understood or grasped. Dominance and submission and aggression. These three are one of the worst, um, well, most worst, the most poorly used phrases when people talk about dogs. It's nine out of ten times completely wrong when somebody mentions these words and the way they use them. And it's just like disturbing. If any, any ethologist is completely thrown off by that. You hear an ethologist talk that bothers the heck out of them because they, these are the ones that are defining these terms, and rightfully so. So if then dog trainers come along and um, annex these terms into their vocabulary and use them completely inappropriately all the time, yeah, I can, I can see how ethologists are ticked off by that. Um, I would be too. Uh, that's all. So there's that little rant on the end. So I hope you found this informative um, and Try to get in the habit of making more videos again. It's been a while with COVID and everything. Been super busy with training. And um, yep, talk to you next time. Bye.